Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, the Vice President of the Royal Asiatic Society, and I'm standing in this evening for our President, and it's a great pleasure to be able to do so uh, on this occasion. For those of you in the room who are not fellows of the Society, please sign up before you leave the premises uh, th this evening, because without the support of our members, we cannot uh, put on such wonderful functions as we do throughout the year. It's a particular pleasure to be able to uh, chair this evening because Jessica and I go back um, a, a rather long way. I won't say exactly uh, how far, but, um, but when I was a, a very youthful uh, graduate student, only just, literally only just, um, I had the, uh, what has turned out to be a pleasure, but at the time was a formidable uh, task. Yes. Of, um, of, there was this bright young woman from Newhall, uh, and uh, for some reason, the director of studies at, at Newhall thought that um, uh, she might pick up some hints from me about modern European history because I had just done it in the July before, so in the June before. So, uh, so we went through my old essays, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and ever since, I've been able to say, my very first pupil was the Warden of Merton. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, had a very distinguished career uh, in the British Museum. And before that, although she read history uh, in Cambridge, she went uh, with enormous uh, dedication to do Chinese at SOAS. Um, and she combined learning Chinese at SOAS with administering the National Health Service as a young graduate uh, uh, in, in the civil service. So this is a, a truly remarkable person and uh, and we're great friends, and so it's a real pleasure to invite you to uh, to talk to this assembly tonight about gold horses and the rise of the Silk Road. Jessica. Yes, Gordon, Gordon hasn't explained that his essays in the exam which he passed so brilliantly, were much better than anything I could achieve. Um, so the civil service did me well, and they taught me finally to write a few sentences. But at Cambridge, well, the best essay I wrote for him was on Russia, which is perhaps relevant to tonight. Um, because the gold you're seeing here is in Russia. It's in what is called the Tuva Republic, which is north of just north of Mongolia, in the, the Cyan Mountains, they're an extension of this enormous amount of mountain ranges called the Altai Cyan. And that is where the gold is found. And these are the source and origin of everything you know about the Scythians. They are much earlier than the Scythians, and they're part of a large assembly of mobile pastoralists, some very powerful, that stretch gradually the whole way across Eurasia to the Black Sea, as you know, and there they met the Greeks. So we, because we know about the Greeks, we know about the Scythians, but most people don't know about Arjan, and Arjan is the name of these great Kurgans, great mounded tombs in the Tuva. And that is where, even for China, some of the gold comes from. Naturalists are essential. So these were worn on the hat, the cap, great tall cap of the man who's buried in the tomb, Arjan II, in the Tuva. Now, I've just recently finished a book, so a lot of the book is about the nature of Chinese tombs, and here we have tombs that you all ought to know, but I'm sure many of you have seen. This is the Chanling, the, one of the earliest tombs at the Ming tomb area in near Beijing, and it's beautifully placed, has the mountains protecting it at the back, and it faces the river. So um, tombs are where everything we know in the British Museum or the v &A come from. All the Chinese objects we look at come out of these tombs. And as I'll say very briefly, but not explain in detail, 
The Chinese had a deep commitment to the afterlife. When someone died, they produced a fantastic tomb and put in everything needed for a rich afterlife. And if that hadn't happened in China, we wouldn't have anything to look at because that's where everything dated up to the, at least the Song dynasty in the 12th century, that's where everything comes from. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about geography because the horses, the gold, and the Silk Road is also all about geography. But above all, we need to recognize where China is. And China thought it was in the middle of the universe, like um, people thought Jerusalem was. Both were a mistake. China is east of the Tibetan Plateau, and it is not possible to cross the Tibetan Plateau. So the world is divided here, and these mountains really provide a key route northwards. And here is the Altai Sion, where that gold comes from. So if you're operating in China, if you're ruling China, you have a wall on your west and the sea on the east, and it's like a bag, beautiful bag, which is pretty solid at the bottom. It's not easy, impossible to get to India. Actually, this is a very nasty part of the world. Lots of snakes, big jungle, people still causing a lot of trouble there. So who comes in? They come from the north. And this is where, of course, people say the Silk Road is so obvious. But if you look at it now, you can see it's heavily arid and it's covered in desert. These are some of the, this is definitely one of the worst bit deserts in the world. This is the Tukla Kaman, Tukla Makan, crossed by Stein from India, but in the winter, carrying ice. And here we have other, lots of deserts. The Gobi Desert's not too, not as bad, but not easy to cross. So where is the Silk Road anyway? The Silk Road is what we call the two routes around this big desert. And then they get out here, but with enormous difficulty to Tashkent, then there are more deserts. So anybody who thinks the route across Central Asia is easy, hmm, I wouldn't think so. I've been there a lot. I think it's fascinating. But there's, if you look out of the aeroplane, it's a terror, terrifying sight. The alternative is actually to come along this mountain range and up here and through there. And that is what is important to China. The most important thing to China in its early period is the depth. That provides the only serious link with Western Asia where a lot is going on. But you can see what the Tibetan Plateau looks like. This is what it looks like. This is the edge, the west eastern edge of the Tibetan Plateau. It looks like this. Not very cozy. And then unless you are accommodated, unless you've developed high altitude living, so to speak, you're not going to walk across it because you have to get the yaks. There are no yaks to begin with, and you have to have barley. There's no barley to begin with. So um, crossing the Tibetan Plateau wasn't an option. Nobody mentions this. Um, here, you can see why Western Asia and Europe are not like China. The climate is wildly different, and we're living this week still through this. It's winter rain, people are planting crops, and they'll start to grow. So we have winter rain, and the crops grow through the winter and fed by the winter rain. China is in the other part of the universe where the Pacific monsoon is what is important. It's rains in summer, and there they have millet and rice, and we have barley and wheat. And in the middle, both the Tibetan Plateau and this area are amazingly arid. So that um, one has to think of the mountains as actually being helpful. The mountains bring down rain, bring down water off the height from the clouds that hitch themselves on the mountains. So crossing not on low land, but on high land has some advantage. The other issue to remember is that this part of East Asia that is, the eastern step is at 2,000 meters a lot of the time. That is extremely cold in the winter, but quite warm, 40, 30 degrees in the summer. And one thing also, which is quite important to try and get a sense of what's going on, is to look at the Mediterranean. This is our world in the West, and our world is sea-related, and a lot of the Mediterranean in particular is very rocky, so there's not large areas of, of rain. Here in eastern 
China, huge area covered in grain. So this area is full of trade and this area is not. So these are huge differences between East and West. And if I was to explain why we're not getting along with China, I would start here. If you don't recognize this geographical distance and difference, here you can see the rock rather well. Um, you don't recognize that difference. You don't understand why our whole attitude, our whole development of life, our whole culture is completely different. And one thing one does have to remember about China is the northern part of China is covered in sand. This is sand. And this is the, what we call Lois here. And this is the deepest deposit. Over here, it's 200 meters deep. That's pretty deep. Towards Beijing, it flies in in the winter, but is only 10 meters deep. But it goes right up here too, and also south. This is something nowhere else in the world has. There's Lois in America, there's Lois in Germany, but it's not on this scale. This is 2,000 kilometers east to west and at least 500 kilometers north-south. And this is what it looks like. And those of you who've been to China will have seen it, but you haven't been told that it's significant. It is, however, very significant because it covers all the likely minerals and ores that you might need. There's no visible copper here and there's no visible gold. So we're going to come to that a bit further. But if you're short of copper and gold, that's quite significant. So this is what it looks like. There are some stones up here, but also there is no stone building. The first buildings were built here. This is the Yellow River Basin, and they were faced by a landscape in which stone was less likely to occur. It wasn't impossible, but it's less likely to occur. So here we get to see the contrast. This is a typical temple in Sicily, and here is part of the Forbidden City. This is not a platform made of stone. It's a platform made of earth and painted nicely with a bit of plaster and some nice stone decoration. But these are wooden columns on column bases. And the roofs are held by a complicated cantilever that stretches out beyond the column. So this is very complicated. And the column is here, and you need it to go out to support the roof to keep it dry. So this is a single most important development for Lois. I mean, the shortage of minerals are going to be compensated for. But the wooden architecture based on platforms is not going to be compensated for. And if you think of Japan and Korea, it spreads to them, regardless of the fact they don't have any looks. So once you start on an idea, it spreads. It spreads south where there's plenty of stone. It spreads east. But of course, it doesn't cross the Tibetan Plateau. It can't cross the Tibetan Plateau. So um, we've seen one of the things that is important. The other is, of course, the tombs. No, I won't I'll go back. Um, the tombs are also in this lowest area, and they can dig 10 metres or 15 metres deep without it falling in. In England, you're not allowed to dig below one and a half metres without shattering the, to the, the, the trench. So the fact that you can dig 10 metres or 15 metres without it falling in mm -hmm. is due to the extraordinary geological features of this lowest. Then the northerners having set a standard, everybody followed. So biggest and most elaborate tomb structures in the world going on to the 19th century are in China. But as nobody sees them open, or hardly ever, we don't think about it. But these tombs are the key to us seeing China. If there were no tombs, we wouldn't see what they produce. Now here we see the trouble with the metals. Um, here you see that the dark red is where metal starts. In Asia, and spreads through the Mediterranean. It also spreads eastwards. But India is quite interesting for those of us interested in India. In fact, the strong use of metal goes down the west side. And the east side is not so strong. And here you see a big gap. It does not cross to China that way. It crosses to, to China through the steppe. And the people who are bringing it are the people with herds. The herded animals, the cattle, sheep, and goats, are domesticated in northern the northern Euphrates area. They are not domesticated in China. 
They are present in the Tibetan highlands and in the various um, regions of mountains, but the Chinese are not living there and they do not domesticate herded animals and they do not domesticate horses. So as well as the metal, this is all crossing from Western Asia but through the north. It cannot come through the south. The Tibet is in the way and India is certainly not ideal and you can see here there's not even much metal. The same is, the, this is, shows you the geological foundations and here you see the Yangtze and here you see the Mino River. And the only places with gold up here or down here, so gold is not available in the middle. So in the main part of China, there's a very big shortage of copper and there is no gold. And that's really quite important, as is the animal question. You want to think about why is China like it is and why does the Silk Road have any function? It is due to the shortages of metal animals and the difficulty of crossing. Now, if I turn to the first tomb, which has a lot of gold in it, it's really only in the eighth century. This is a time when the, the people in the steppe have started to ride. Now, at one level, this is a very conventional guy. He, he owns the, the ritual vessels at the top. Sorry. Doesn't, he seems to like jumping around. Um, he owns the vessels at the top, then his wife owns the next one, his concubine, the ones below, and at the bottom, his son. And he's in one of these very deep tombs built in the lowest. It's 13 meters deep. And standing on the edge, I feel very nervous. Um, you can just see at the bottom, there is on the bottom of the main trench, you can see there's a little bamboo shuttering to prevent it falling in. But basically, it's not falling in because the area is very arid. There's no water in the soil, and it's not raining. Now, he has a lot of gold. And I've just told you there's no gold where he lives. So this is quite an important question, one that people don't ask very often. But here, risky to press, no. Here, he's wearing a belt. This is a belt. The Chinese do not wear belts. They wear long robes, which they tie with a sash made of textile. They don't wear belts. They don't carry weapons. This is the sheath for a dagger. They don't carry weapons. It's not polite. So the fact that we carry weapons and wear belts and speak an Indo-European language and ride horses is all a feature of our contact with the people in the steppe. And this guy has clearly got good contacts. You can't get this much gold without good contacts. And it's very likely that his spouse came from further north in the lowest plateau. He didn't come from the steppe. This doesn't mean he's in contact with the steppe. It means he's in contact with someone who is in contact. with him. He's got to have got this somehow. And not only he's got a, his thumb rings for shooting. Now, in China, no member of the league does any fighting. So this, again, is sort of steppe behavior. He's got bracelets, steppe behavior. He's got lots of little animals. So this is a step outfit on a man who's buried in the most conventional tomb he could get hold of. And he's also a member of the ruling clan. So this shows that something is happening in the 8th century that we're a bit uncomfortable about, but we don't really know what's happening. And he doesn't talk about it. But his wife wears this. This is the sort of stuff you see on Mongolian women in later times. You see in Troy. And here he's got some knives with iron blades, and that is another clue. China does not use iron until stimulated into doing it by contact through the step. So the background to the Silk Road is that there is an impediment in the Tibetan plateau. You can't go straight across. And the very first contact is through the step. And the step remains to this day an important feature, as you know, from Putin's agreement about selling gas same stuff. So here we have, but what is important in the step is a little boy on the horse. He's at, we're at um, Karaburgas in the Mongolian, in Mongolia, in outer Mongolia, and in 2017, I'm there with a group, small group of Oxford people with a smaller group of Chinese, and the boy is concerned about who is getting in his way and going onto the um, 
this is the city wall, what are they doing on his city wall? So he jumps on his pony and comes to look. And he's quite anxious about it. The Mongolians are not that keen on seeing the Chinese in their territory. But um, you now can see that the geology or the geography in a slightly different way. Here are the mountains, and the mountains are a lot more easy to deal with than this, Tatlamakan or Tibet. So this, the Altai, and this is Tuba, where we're going to see things. Arjan is the place with all that gold, and here is Lake Baikal. So I've flown many times across this, and it's my greatest wish always to take more photographs. It never helps me understand, but to take more photographs of either Baikal or all these big mountains. This area is a sort of the size of France. So it's a big, big place. And this part of the step is, of course, 2,000 kilometers, 2,000 meters high. So this is the arc, which is an area that is recognized as having a cultural behavior that is not the mainstream Chinese. The people here are a mixture of agriculturalists and pastoralists. They have a lot of animals. This is how the animals get into China. And to this day, there are quite a lot of pastoralists here, even inside China. But in mainstream China, you never see horses or cows in the agricultural land. They don't have mixed farming as we do, and um, they don't like eating mutton. So, I mean, they're in a different world in the Central Plains. This is the Central Plain, and this is where they grow rice now, but also millet. And today, maize, of course, but maize is coming from America much later. And at this, the time that is important, the time of the tomb I've just shown you, is the time of the spring and autumn period and the warring states. That is from the eighth century until the conquest by the Qin, it's divided into many different states. And one of you actually just talked, <clears throat> one of you just talked about Zhongshan. There is Zhongshan. And um, these states are extremely important because they're the ones that are going to be, have to be subdued. And to the north is that. This is Mongolia, and these are the deer stones. And the important feature about the horses in Mongolia is that this area, which is pale blue, doesn't have enough of certain kinds of nu nutrients to feed to horses. And also the people in the blue area in the past used to be susceptible to what is called the cashing beck disease. That is their bones and their joints did not form properly. There's plenty of this. Of course, I think most of the trouble is it's far too hot in the summer and far too humid. For the horses to run fast and to be useful, they have to be able to sweat. If it's humid and hot, they can't sweat. So the whole of the central China is not good news. And the south is very bad news because this is extremely humid. And I've, when I first went to China, I couldn't understand why it was always raining. But it was. However, you hear, see here in the north, it's much better. And it's the same true in Mongolia. Mongolia, as I said, in the winter is extremely cold. And even in the summer, it's windy. There's not a tree in sight and there are no cabbages. So difficult. Anyway, that's where the horses are. And that's what is going to cause the trouble for China for the best part of 2,000 years. This is what Mongolia looks like. You can see there's a shortage of trees, no cabbages. And that's what a deer stone actually looks like. And you can see the familiar stuff and animals on the, this part. This happens to have a head on it, but that's very rare. They often have little bits of jewelry. So you can see they've got little earrings and then they have weapons. The weapons are what is important. This is a rain holder for driving a horse in a cart. This is an ax. These are wet stones, and they have lots of daggers, often with animal heads, and they have a whole set of burials where the main mound is in the middle, but all around are repeated interments, burials of horse heads and horse bones. They're not all buried at once, or maybe twice a year, and they're part of a very complicated ceremony of the horse, and you would never see this, and you don't see this in China. This is the place I showed you where the gold comes from, and therefore we're going to the north of Mongolia, but not very far north. This is the Tuva. The Tuva Republic is in 
eastern Siberia, if you like. Here it's a mountainous zone in the Sion, and the mounds are the burials of the lords of the region, and they're, they're called the kingly mounds. Here's one on, this is the Aujan II under excavation, and this is their log coffin, and you can see they're covered in gold. And this is a gold quiver, that their boots with gold, the man has gold tops to his boots, and he's covered in these tiny animals. He has more than 2,000 little panthers cast gold on his clothes. The, these are reconstruction of what these two look like. The man is the important one for this, for our purposes. You can see he has the horses on his cap and he has a very elaborate belt. belt. The Chinese do not wear belts, I just repeat that, and they do not carry weapons attached to their belts. That would not be nice ritual behavior. So they, he's also wearing soft shoes, and I will repeat that later. Soft shoes are the sign that they're riding. So they don't want to kick their horses with pointed shoes. So they're wearing soft leather shoes. He happens to have gold around his leggings and his boots, and he has a talk. And if you go to the British Museum, you'll see these talks go right across Europe, right across Central Asia, and not the steppe, really, all the way to the Celts and Britain. So it's a culture that does not embed itself in. Here you see the place where it does go. Um, it goes to the mountains north of Beijing. These are the Yen Mountains north of Beijing. And the map, which is from the book I've just finished, um, shows you where the, the drawing is, the map is made, and then it shows you the other step sites to the northwest. And the tombs here show that the people who've moved in to around Beijing in the 8th to 7th, 6th, 5th century have close relations with the step, that he is wearing a set of bronze animals on his clothes made of, in the shape of balls. And he has one of the very early types of belt hook. This is a belt hook hoop for the belt. And here you see it, it's up here. Here's the ram, and this is the circle. And then this is the disc, there are many other discs here. But all, there's some more of these discs, they come from his belt. And he has weapons in his belt. He's lying on various kinds of textile. This one is decorated with bronzes all the way around. And most important of all, from understanding who he is, has a row of animal heads, 10, 10 of which are horses. So he's buried here. He has one rare piece of gold in the shape of a tiger. He has step arrowheads, and maybe not from step, but he's perhaps the second or third generation from the step. And they're moving gradually into the edge of China from Mongolia. Now, why did they move? Probably occasionally, it's a very bad news in the snow. It snows and then it rains and then it freezes. And that makes it impossible for the horses to get through to the grass. The horses are very important to the steppe people because they can beat up, crush the snow and push it away so the cattle can feed, or sheep can feed. But the horses, like everybody else, cannot get through the ice. So every now and then there's an impossible winter in the steppe and people move a little bit closer, slightly better environments. This is not much better. It's still very high, it's still very cold in the winter. But we can see that these people are closely connected from their belts. This is the man we saw in the Tuva. He is from the Russian Republic, from the Altai Sion. And at the top is, a re is his belt laid out. And it consists of a plaque or a section which is, has a cross section like this. So through a if you have a row of these with this section, you can run a, a belt through it. And they are current. This kind of belt is current in what is today Russian Republic and in Kazakhstan. And it is never used in China. So this, though this man in the tomb I've just shown you lived on the borders of China, as you see, he had a belt. His is on the right. And the drawing of that belt is on the left. in the region of Beijing knew uh, what a belt should look like and how it should be worked because the Chinese in due course made belts with plaques on them 
but not belts that ran through these sections like a loop. So um, he's got his belt, as you can see, running through. Also, you can see the weapons are similar, not the same. Um, this man in the tuba has an iron blade in a gold gilded or golden grip. The man on the left, who, whose tomb we've seen, has two bronze weapons, but the same combination of a dagger with two and a knife. And the combination dagger and knife then moves into China. And here you see an example of the obsession with horses that the Chinese develop. This is a tomb in the northeast, and um, he's buried with stone around the main chamber, which is a very much a step behavior. And he has, they only excavated 250 horses, but he probably had 600. Now, nobody in the step would actually want to bury that many, and the most you ever see is something like 20 or 30 in the step. Here, in northeastern China, this is an extravaganza, which could only be inspired by people who could bring him horses. Given that I've told you horses are difficult to breed in China, you can breed them, but they don't become stronger. And they bred them and killed them and laid them out in neat rows, which is pretty extraordinary. And in, China, in the steppe, actually, they wouldn't put them round the tomb as they have here. They would have put them in a separate deposit to the, to the east of the tomb. However, these unusual tombs spread also into the Qin state. And it's really important that these people who are going to conquer all the other states, that is the Qin, um, follow some of their practices. And this guy does indeed have a horse pit near this big tomb. And he is probably a sixth century Duke of the Qin, and he's in Western China, a long way from that. However, um, he's in an area that is full of people from the steppe. Um, what's happening is the steppe has got richer. It's got all this gold. It's got masses of horses. And the Qin are a very peripheral state from Chinese point of view. And they are in the West. And so they're going to move East and they're going to conquer China. But their position in the West has given them access both to the weapons and the gold, but also the horses. And that's really why I'm mentioning them. So here on the right are weapons probably from that tomb. It was loot, they were found in a minor deposit, which was probably due to that tomb being looted. And on the left, you see the, the bronze dagger and knives from the Arjan tomb. So that the, if you like, the kind of weapons you need to have if you're a grand man are now made in the Qin area, but imitating the step. And you can see what's happening, that the, this is a map showing the spread of gold, particularly spread of gold belts, all those square plaques are for belts. It's going, actually coming from the north to China and then carrying on west to the Scythians. So that this interesting gold shows that they've got hold of more gold. This was not possible and not visible, say, a thousand years earlier. There's no evidence of this extravaganza of gold in a thousand years before, or even 500 years before. And what you also see, some of you may know the site of Pasari. It's a site with large tombs like those in the Tuva, but in this case, um, covered in such a way and perhaps very high that the whole tomb froze and the bodies within them were preserved, the leather, the furniture, the physical remains were all preserved in the Pasric tombs. This is a bridle for a horse that was preserved in one of them. And important for the story is that they have S-shaped cheek pieces. So at this date, in fact, these S-shaped cheek pieces spread everywhere. And here, a burial. This was a very nice exhibition at Kazakh uh, from Kazakhstan in Cambridge in autumn 22, and um, they too have this kind of cheek piece, like we see at the top on, on the right. This is a, a, a drawing. It's not by any means, it's a reconstruction <laughs> of the harness of the horse in that site. And what is important 
in this case is not just the cheek piece, but these strings and the spiky bits of leather that hang from the saddle. So both the saddle and the bridle and the cheek piece are now going to turn up somewhere else. And the, who is the, 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 the maneuver of all this? It's the answer is the terracotta warriors. Who is the terracotta warrior? He's a horse rider. He's got soft shoes sewn up leather, and he's wearing a tunic and a belt. And these guys are from the steppe. This is from the Oxus treasure on the borders of Iran. This is from Kazakhstan, and this is the man we saw in Yatuva. And they're all of one type. And this man is probably imported. He's been recruited to work for the first emperor, China, in Tutu, in the third century BC. And he's dressed as though he was going to ride a horse, which is, in fact, a cavalry man. So the cavalry, probably at all times in China, were recruited probably from the borderland. They were not from distant Mongolia. They were from the borderland knew about horses. And if you look at the actual horses, you can see where they've come from. Here is the Kazakhstan horse, and he comes from up here from Beryl. Here is the horse in the first, first emperor's tomb set, and he's made of terracotta. And here you see, this is the Kazakhstan, this is Pazarik up in the north, and here is actually inside China, dust um, here. And this this horse has a shaped cheek pieces like these, and he has a soft saddle shown in clay, and it, I hope you can just see hanging strings, just like the Kazakhstan one. So I don't think the horses in the First Emperor's tomb come from Kazakhstan. I'm arguing instead that we should think of this whole region as having one tradition of horse riding and horse managing, and that the people who support the first emperor, he needs a lot of support. If you're going to, if you've ever seen that tomb and you try to think how it was built, you need to, you need a lot of support to do that. And the Chinese themselves, mm -hmm. but because he's from a rather primitive background, the Qin are anything a bit primitive, he actually had a lot of help from the Eastern people. But I would think many now argue he also had quite a lot from the West. So the world that he thought he, he governed, conquered, was the whole world. So he would not have shirked getting horses and horse managers from further West. They're part of his world, as part of the whole controlled area that he feels he controls. So I think that we have to look hard at this horse and recognize that he has a lot to do with Kazakhstan with today's cousins. This is the tomb, and now we're in an extraordinary engineering. It is at least 20 stories high, but deep. So this is 35 meters, and this is 35 meters, and we don't know how they did it. Nobody has actually excavated. This has been done by what the Chinese do all the time. They do coring with a drill down, but they also have done it with remote sensing. So um, I believe this is semi-correct. We will never know. I don't think the Chinese will ever allow it to be excavated. But um, people have found these stones. It has stones. This is a section. So they have underground, if you like, a sort of encasement around this, the tomb chamber. So the, how the first emperor did it and how they built this tomb and how they did all these thousands of terracottas is just something that shows we're looking at a world with a con control of manpower we can't envisage here, and we have never seen. The nearest we come is with the Romans or 19th century industrialized Britain, but they didn't build this. This is done in Lois. This is not. This is done near Xi'an, where the Lois is at least 100 meters deep, possibly 200. So you can get a lot of it. And this is what it looks like when, I'm sure many of you have seen this, this is the famous picture of one of the pits, and it's a very complicated, very, very complicated site with as many as 50 or 30 to 50 posits around the main tomb. This is the main tomb, and it has other things, really amazing cast bronze birds in the north. It's a really staggering site, but actually those of us who study China wish 
people would think more about places like warriors because they're not the only place. Now, um, if we think about what has come through the step, we see a row of technologies that have come and a row of materials and artifacts. So that this has been an enormously important um, like transfer route, both of technology, but also materials. And um, I've followed this a bit in a bit more detail in my book, but um, you have to take it for granted that I actually think this is correct. But we now have to move to why is the Silk Road important? Well, the Silk Road is this yellow line, sort of. I think it's slightly overestimating the singularity of it. There are many routes across this appalling area. Um, you go up this route here, past Lanjo. This is between the Tibetan highland and the Gobi Desert. It's not cozy at all. And it's a, a route of oases with deserts in between. And the, this is much worse. These are routes of oases with deserts in between. And the numbers of people who got through initially were probably very few. And nobody ever went the whole way. What they're doing is moving from one place to the next to exchange horses, exchange goods, and then someone else takes it on. And there's a very good book by Valerie Hansen that explains this in detail. I would always read that rather than anything else about the Silk Road. Now, why did they go? What was driving them? It was, again, those people in Mongolia. The Mongolians, perhaps by symbiosis with the Chinese, the Chinese had got unified, and then they developed the Han dynasty of power. And that's a very powerful dynasty. The people in Mongolia equally start to develop a unified rule of some sort. Um, the, and one should never underestimate the people in the steppe. They are amazingly sophisticated. And when they choose to do things together, they do things on quite a large scale. So the, um, the Mongolian area has developed a power called the Shunnu, and they are causing a lot of trouble to the Han. They're actually making them pay tribute. So one of the problems for the Chinese is over a very long period, nearly a thousand years, they're paying tribute to keep the people in Mongolia from raiding them. And so what do they decide to do? They decide, well, we'd better try and find some other people to get horses from. And we'll go west. And that's what happened. They started to build military, military, um, if you like, camps or military inhabitation areas who could then get horses. And how did they pay for the horses and the people in the military camps? They paid in silk. And we have in the British Museum one bolt of this silk. It's plain white silk. And Stein, all Stein, found it at one of these sites. And that is the coinage, if you like, time in that area. Um, in due course, they trade other things. But initially, the silk, which after all comes from down here, Anjo, down here, where it's hot, humid, and sticky, that's where the silk comes from. And it's what is it doing? It's going up here to be traded for horses. And you know the stories about getting blood sweating horses and so on, they come from the Fagana Valley, which is over here. So um, you have to go quite a way to get horses of different kinds. And Han Wudi, the big um, ruler around 100 BC, desperately needed horses. And that's where the Silk Road begins. Once it starts, um, the sentences which you read there, Lolan, Ola, Ucha, and so on, they become large oasis settlements. And they are centers in their own rights, but they're not inhabited primarily by Chinese. They are often um, Indo-European or Turkic peoples, and they trade and become Buddhist. And this is the route that Buddhism came to. So as much comes east as goes west. So when you read about the Silk Road, you need to ask yourself, which, what is going which way and why? So it looks like this. It's not easy route. You can see that a lot of it is desert, then you see the southern green, and then you see the Tian Shan. These are the celestial mountains, the mountains of the sky or of heaven. And the highest, and I'm looking probably, I took that photograph, uh, 7,000 meters high. So it's not an easy trek, but that's actually the ridge on which the steppe people settle. So people who go along the Silk Road can, in those mountains, find people, horses. 
but you also could go further north, not high. And this is the silk, and the silk is one of China's great. But unlike us, they use a little bolo, not a punch card system. But what we make, the, the various we, we woven systems that we make in the 18th century with punch and 19th with punch card systems, they use a manual construction to the boy to pull it up and pull it down. So the looms are quite frighteningly complicated, and I don't even know how to begin to describe them. And the place to see them is the Hangzhou Silk Museum. If you're ever in Hangzhou, where um, Alibaba is, and this great lake, you can, the Silk Museum is one of the real calling points. And coming in the other way is, of course, the Buddhist. And they're doing something that changes China quite dramatically. Um, on the top left is Palmyra, not Palmyra, Petra. And you see the figures between columns. The figures between columns is an architectural feature of the West, of Rome, Britain, every cathedral you've ever seen. It goes with Hellenistic and travel with um, trade to India and the, like, Afghanistan to the Kushans. Here you have in Afghanistan figures in that kind of architecture. And then it turns up in China and has traveled the whole way across the top. Um, to Lolan. And so at the British Museum, we actually have wooden architecture that shows. Here you see a Buddhist figure with a column and a sort of fake Ionic column, capital. And here you see the kind of ornaments you might see in the Hellenistic world. Actually, they come from Yungang. This is Yungang near the northern capital of the northern way, Datong. So one of the few pictures I managed to steal by not by taking it from outside the cave. And here you see the kind of route we're talking about from India up the Khyber Paris Pass. It does not come this way. It might come by sea, but it doesn't come this way. And then through the desert area, these are Isil, Dunhuang, and Yungang, which I've shown you. So as much as a horse route or a silk route, this is a Buddhist route, and it's absolutely critical to China because it enlarges their sense of how big the world is. Suddenly, they learn about a, a whole area with writing, with scripts, with different art forms, and they send people out to find out more. At much the same time, or a bit, a bit more similar time, period of Byzantium, you also get people meeting through the steppe due to the Turks. People we call the Turks living in Anatolia are later descendants of people who come from this area. And they spread down into Xinjiang, causing a lot of trouble for the early Chinese dynasty, the Sui, and then the Tang. The Tang then dominate. This is in Tibet, but you see here in China, this is in, in the north, in, in the, what I call the Ark. This is in Japan. You see the dish, dishes here in the west. And there is what I would call a diplomatic route. People are exchanging um, diplomats and drinking and eating of gold and silver. And that is not a Chinese behavior because they haven't got any gold, they're pretty short of silver. So the fact that the Chinese do this shows the immense impact of this relationship with the West. And here, if I like to end by saying we should actually see that the Eurasia consists of three enormous groups and they're uh, independent. Though they influence each other and make exchanges, what we're looking at is China here down with its enormous, enormous area of rice and millet, but not so much use of the sea, and an enormous wall here, which they can penetrate, they cannot go across. So this is China, and it is in my view, a completely independent culture. And so when we talk about the Stone Age, Bronze Age and the Iron Age, I wouldn't apply them to China. China does something different. And if you go over here, you find the linked up mobile peoples who go from the edge of China all the way to the, to the Caspian and the Black Sea. And it's really important to see that these are in fact the drivers 
these are the most important people because they supply the horses, they supply danger, they supply change. They may supply different things to different people, but they're very, very important. And the child any help by constantly calling them barbarians. Yes, mm -hmm. barbarians, but we're barbarians to the Chinese. I can tell you, getting my Chinese visa at the moment is proving extremely difficult because we are very much not important to the Chinese. And down here, this is Mesopotamia, and it's closely linked. This is the edge of Iran, and this is the Tiger and Euphrates Valley. And here you see what I would call the rocky Mediterranean. Though there's plenty of space here, this is not that good in terms of crop compared with this. So who has got the advantage? I, would, I think one should be careful. And I do, in fact, think neither the Chinese nor the Western powers pay any attention to the difference in our histories. And as a result, we're always at loggerheads. And it would be very useful if more people paid attention to the three points that join us together and keep us apart. So that's where I probably will end. I think that's where I end. Yes, I end with the usual map. This is what I think is the key to understanding China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was wonderful. I mean, it is part of the uh, of the argument about this that that China, uh, this sort of hot and humid place, has all this rice and it has millions and millions of people, and that's what gives it the edge. In uh, because they have devised social structures that enable them to uh, to control so much land and so many. Uh, people, and that I mean, in, uh, India and 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 Europe is much more fractured by comparison. Well, I also think I didn't talk about it, but I also think it's the language. Um, the Chinese devised the cleverest form of writing you can think of in the world, because it is not pronunciation dependent. So everybody across the whole of China can read the same characters, speak mm -hmm. different languages, other like. German, Dutch, Scandinavian languages are similar to English. We can't read them because they're written in alphabet. So though we, people often in my youth, when I was struggling at so to learn Chinese, said, of course, they'll take up alphabet. Well, I don't think so, because the single script keeps the whole place together. So I think that's one of the secrets. The other is the huge population. If you want to make use of the population, you're going to have to control it. And from the first emperor, it registers people and you can't move and that's true today so there must be comments and questions that people okay. would like to put yes please so well um, one thing is that in, if you pen animals in China, you find they're fed with millet. So the grain, you can feed horses with millet. Um, I think in much of China, in the highlands, they certainly kept them, and they do today, and they certainly managed to breed them up. But if you read about how people living in Mongolia operate, one man would have at least four horses in turn. I don't think the Chinese have a fighting force that match them. So um, Mongolians could, one horse was killed or one horse was they jumped on another. I didn't think a minute about that. The Chinese probably wore much more complicated clothing, armor than the Mongolians. I think it made life. But China also takes a terrible blow on the Mongol invasion. It's never quite the same again. So, actually, read about China, ancient period in the medieval period. I think you find the contribution of these outside contributors in many ways positive. Chinese wouldn't admit that in the past. 
constant pile of people. Once, once the Chinese had been defeated by the Mongols, they wound up in Siberia where they took much. They rebuilt it all. Life is more divided. Yes, yes, please. Are they capable of um, being very active in the area of water? What about the role of the channel? Once China had really settled having a capital in Beijing, which they didn't do till the 15th century, then they're on the camel route into central China. And in the north, they will manage the camel. I don't think the camel is any happier than the marsh horses. Yes. So I think what you have to think of, camel is functioning in um, my call up. It's a great big area which is arc shaped round this area. If you can think of that, you can see the arc. If you go from here, big arc, in this area, that's also, I think the you think about it, over here, this is a short pocket. Only the engine and not tiny time. The balance of which here is a lot. Um, yes, camels are okay, and you certainly need them in India, definitely. But it has got to be one of them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. My big question is we're worried about the horses. What about the people? That wonderful tomb you showed that the Chinese have not yet excavated needed houses and parts. Where did their people come from? And that kind of dry well, matter. They weren't growing rice there. No. Well, you can grow rice around Xi'an, yes, in the river valley, but they would have had millet. But people who, there's no doubt that in every culture, the elite are living on the work of the poor. And so, a million, millions of poor, and they're suffering enormously, dying enormously. Did they have sheep then to eat? I don't, well, they meat would not have eaten. And I don't think anybody poor will have had any meat. Um, the Chinese diet, if you go there today, is actually very heavily not meat, very heavily grain and vegetables. But, I mean, that is one aspect of China. It's not been better than that we have. But you know, it depends where on the social system come. And in fact, they would have eaten grain if they could. The other thing is people would so we should kept them hot over China enough. And um, one thing the Chinese have not done, in my view, done research on transport up and down the river. I said they didn't use the sea much. They did use the sea, but lots of pirates, local people here. But the people in the capital would use the river. And they had this huge canal, Grand Canal, from the 60s, which carried grain up to Peking. So, um, grain, grain, and more grain. It's a very different life. You think about sheep, for instance. You have people stealing sheep. It's much quicker to grow rich stealing sheep than stealing grain. <laughs> so, I think, um, <laughs> I in fact, they didn't steal grain. I mean, they had enormous supply of police and control systems for very large granaries. That is all about control. It's the question then. The reading guide says um, that what I just Mongolian food, that being very thick, having very hot food, until the first time of horses were bigger than the Mongolian 
Mm -hmm. They have some searching. Sounds like it's course fairly bigger. Well, you have two, have two things to say. One is the horse, horse research at the moment is racing up. And they have just done a lot of research to show horses that we think of in the Far East, not the Vulsky horses, They're not small horses. They are the horses we are familiar with, which can be big. How big they were, I don't know, but they are not they are the present day horse. And they are used in Mongolia from the beginning, not the present. So uh, that's all been done on DNA, and the plan to read is Vibrado. I want to find, look up on the web Vibrado or Ando Ludovic. Ando, you might find long articles on DNA which tell you about this. The earliest they've discovered was in the West, the West. So they don't come from. From, from the steppe. Have they were before the steppe? No. But I don't think one should worry about the smallness. The people small right. Chinese are small in those days, and Australians are now are very large and heavy. Don't suppose they were in those days. Richard. I think we dispute that too. We should just hate that when we were making that okay, well, <laughs> Try not to mention it in the macabre. Um, there's a man called Victor Mayer. M -A -I. Okay. He has written, took him up on the web. He's published a lot. He's very interested in who the Tokari are living, you might say, in the oases. I don't think there's any doubt. People in central, in central northern cities, very likely not to have been Mongolian or Turkish, Indo European or Indo European. And they're buried with baskets of. In quite an early period. So we're looking at a complicated story. I don't I would go to Victor Mayer if I wanted to know a bit more. He definitely he's very happy to talk if you send him an email. And he's published a thing called the Sino Platonic Paper. Some will, some will cover this. So I would um want to know about the linguistics of that. One of the things that is quite clear. Is that China is not a single entity anyway, but it is a single written language. It is not the same which is to the north. So in the early period, those men with gold may have been Iranian Turks, the Europeans, but they have rapidly replaced people who we associate with Alta, the Turkey, the Turkic race, and who are not unrelated. Closely Korean. So um, languages are crap. Don't try. I, I stick to the objects because I think they're a bit easier. I don't think I'll ever get to, to master these languages. But it is Victor Mayer is deeply into this. I would certainly look him up on the web. Certainly think quite fine in the Sino Platonic papers, which you can get as a download. You may find some about languages. The people that we talk to talk about are called the Tokarian. That's the Western. The only same. I mean, by the time you travel several, you have to think everything's in thousands of years. Nothing comes in two miles. We're talking on scale. Get from even the Tuscan community. Right. <laughs> you want to come back? I have a quick question on gold deposits. Um, I always read that the um, yeah, very little gold. Who, who had very little? Uh, the except land, except from Mongolia, from the venture. But, but you, you mentioned what? Large. No, what, what I said is 
Altai Mountain. And Huva is in the Altai Sion group. You get that, that mustard big of gold. The great thing, which Russia is from crazy as you know, the more mountains you have, the more minerals you have. The steppe has the problem of being flat, large grinding rivers depositing mud, no trees and no cabbages. That's a problem. But once you've got in the mountain, you've got me. Why? I'm so friendly with Russia and Afghanistan, Wales. All those are very important. Everybody should look at my mountain. That's all I can say. Own a few mountains quickly. <laughs> we should invade Wales. <laughs> well, I, I think thank thank you very much. I mean, there the are two sort of general points that I'd like to to pull out of this. One is th this was um, a very uh, ecological uh, set of arguments, was it not? Uh, and that suggests that uh, that is a very profitable and good way to approach and that one must never forget that geography is really, really important. And the second thing, of course, is that you said what we glibly call Central Asia or this whole steppe area, which uh, receives really quite inadequate attention uh, nowadays. This is an area, too, in which uh, far more uh, research should be done because the story of how the steppe and its people, the steppes and the people are uh, influenced. I mean, you know, we've all been overrun by these Mongols, have we not? And uh, uh, it, it influences all your three discrete mm. uh, geographical um, areas. So thank you very much for that. There is uh, further refreshment if people would like, and uh, Jessica will be here for a moment or two to uh, to be got at if you want to uh, <laughs> ask her further further questions. But thank you very much indeed.